Hi, this is the AI Storyteller. I'm Mark. The book I'm interpreting for you in this issue is the classic literary masterpiece The Unbearable Lightness of Being. The Unbearable Lightness of Being is the most renowned work by Czech writer Milan Kundera internationally. Kundera is not the kind of writer known for storytelling. Reading his works can be quite challenging. Perhaps his popularity is directly related to the book title. Take a look at his other book titles, such as Immortality, Life is Elsewhere, Book of Laughter and Forgetting, and Identity. These words have transformed themselves, entering broader realms through popular music or advertising slogans, and few people remember their original meanings. Many people know Kundera and recognize his book titles but still find it difficult to read his works. Kundera has always been one of the strong contenders for the Nobel Prize. The high speculation about him winning the prize once compelled the Nobel Committee to issue a denial, announcing that they did not appreciate Kundera's novels. However, this did not diminish the value of Kundera's works. Like great writers such as Kafka and Borges who never received the Nobel Prize, Kundera is destined to leave a profound mark on the literary history of the 20th century. When we read Kundera's novels, we can clearly see the significant differences from many writers before him. Even without reading, there is a simple way to recognize his books. Kundera created a style of writing akin to flashcards, with small, well-marked sections every two or three pages, or sometimes even just one page. These sections are so short that they can't even be called chapters. The first part of the unbearable lightness of being consists of 42 pages, divided into 17 sections. This is closely related to Kundera's writing technique of driving the story through speculation, which we will discuss in detail later. The main reason for mentioning this here is to remind you that Kundera is an artist rooted in the 20th century, distinct from classical writers. Kundera was born in 1929 into an artistic family in Brno, the second largest city in Czechoslovakia. His father, Ludwig Kundera, was a renowned pianist and music theorist as well as the dean of the Janáček Academy of Music and Performing Arts. His father's classical music background profoundly influenced Kundera's artistic education. He learned to play the piano and studied music theory from a young age. While studying classical music, he was inevitably influenced by the German occupation during World War II, and at the same time, he had a strong sense of Czech identity. In 1948, at the age of 19, he entered the philosophy department at Charles University in Prague and joined the Czech Communist Party. After graduating, he became a university professor. He extensively read literature and film theory and began writing poetry. Looking at his creative trajectory, we can see a development from poet and playwright to short story writer and finally to novelist. In 1967, his first novel, The Joke, was published, earning him worldwide acclaim. The Unbearable Lightness of Being is his sixth novel and was written in 1984. In retrospect, this should be considered his peak period of creativity and his last novel written during the Cold War era. After 1975, Kundera immigrated to France. Just a year after the tremendous success of the joke, the general secretary of the Czechoslovak Communist Party, Dubček, initiated a reform movement proposing to build socialism with a human face loosening regulations in various aspects of politics and the economy. This top-down reform received enthusiastic support from the Czech people and became known as the Prague Spring in history. However, this reform also drew dissatisfaction from the Soviet Union, which saw it as a dismantling of the socialist system and an attempt to break free from Soviet control. On August 20, 1968, a Soviet civil aviation plane landed at Prague Airport, and dozens of elite Soviet troops stormed out, occupying the airport. Subsequently, a continuous stream of transport planes followed, with Brezhnev mobilizing three army groups. Within six hours of launching the attack, they occupied the entire territory of Czechoslovakia and arrested the general secretary of the Czechoslovak Communist Party, Dubček. NATO didn't have time to react. The reform came to an abrupt halt. For Kundera, this meant that the reputation he had just gained became a burden because his novel The Joke was based on the political background of the time. Overnight, all his works became banned books. 
He lamented that Western civilization had come to an end in the face of violence. It was a grand farewell, but in reality, on the entire stage of Europe, the military operation didn't have the profound meaning he described. On the contrary, it was light. So light that other countries didn't react much. This dialectic between lightness and heaviness continuously stimulated him, ultimately leading him to write such an immortal work. What exactly is the unbearable lightness of being? The novel begins by quoting Nietzsche's theory of eternal recurrence to explain that if this theory were true, every action in our lives would be repeated infinitely, and in the world of eternal recurrence, every action would carry immense weight and irreversible consequences for oneself, others, and the world. The resulting burden of responsibility would be unbearable for anyone to endure. On the other hand, if life disappears and is gone forever, with no recurrence, then events that only occur once would lack any significance. As time passes, even the most important historical events, such as the French Revolution, gradually become words, theories, and memories, becoming lighter than a feather. In comparison, the Prague Spring, in terms of its historical significance, cannot match the French Revolution. How can those deeply changed by this revolution accept that it has no meaning? If historical events have no meaning, do any decisions made by individuals have meaning? Does life have meaning? This is the essence of the unbearable lightness of being. Within this context, as we read the novel, we discover that its characters are all trapped in the dilemma of lightness and heaviness. The main characters in the novel are four, Tomas, a surgeon, his wife, Teresa, Tomas's mistress, Sabina, and Sabina's other lover, Franz. Like a classical music quartet familiar to Kandera, these four protagonists each play a voice according to the weight of their lives. Here we can reveal in advance that the lightest is Sabina, followed by Tomas, Teresa, and Franz. Tomas is a skilled surgeon, leading a promiscuous life with many lovers. For someone like him, love and marriage are heavy because they imply daily recurrence. Once he falls in love with a woman, he wakes up next to the same body every morning, which he cannot accept. However, Teresa's appearance dramatically changes his perspective. Teresa was originally a waitress in a small town who had a brief encounter with Tomas. She despised her mundane environment and yearned for a life of dignity and culture. So she left everything behind and came to Prague, seeking out Tomas, someone she barely knew. For Teresa, Tomas was like the only door illuminated. In every aspect of life, she and Tomas were unequal, and her vulnerability and courageous risk-taking evoked pity in Tomas. He felt that Teresa was like a baby in a basket floating down the river in the Bible, and he had to extend his hand to her. This metaphor defined their relationship, with Teresa depending on him for a long time while Tomas agonized over it. After they began living together, Teresa fell into a new agony because Tomas struggled to remain faithful and continued to maintain contact with his previous lovers. Tomas found it difficult to understand Teresa's jealousy because he believed that his love and sexual relationships were separate. As long as he remained emotionally loyal to Teresa, an affair was as ordinary as a football match. However, Teresa's pain deeply affected him, trapping him in a psychological loop. Just as he was about to leave to meet his mistress, he would lose his desire due to guilt. Yet, if he went a day without seeing his lover, he would be eager to make an appointment. This awkward situation became evident in a clumsy way on Sabina's bed. Tomas kept checking his watch, wanting to finish hastily. Afterwards, while getting dressed, he couldn't find his socks. After a search, Sabina suggested lending him a pair of women's socks. This was Sabina's way of punishing his absent-mindedness. Sabina, a painter, is the lightest character throughout the work. Like Tomas, she never suffered for family and never had any metaphysical anguish in her attitude towards life. Tomas asked her to find a job for Teresa, and she promptly arranged it. Thanks to Sabina, Teresa became a photographer. After the Soviet invasion, Sabina almost without hesitation left Prague for Switzerland. If Tomas hadn't married Teresa and hadn't raised a dog named Karenin, he probably would have left as well, as he had received an invitation to work at a hospital in Switzerland. However, he was concerned that Teresa wouldn't be able to communicate and adapt there, so he declined the invitation. 
In the novel, although the occupation is recognized as a highly significant historical event, Kundera never focuses on describing it directly. Instead, he recognizes the ambiguity that surrounded the occupation from the beginning. Three days after the occupation, he was stopped and searched by Soviet soldiers on the street. After the search, an officer asked him in Russian, How do you feel? What do you think? He found that the officer was not arrogant but rather friendly. The officer said, It's all a big misunderstanding. But it will be resolved. You should know that we love the Czech people. We love you. During this brief period of ambiguity, Teresa, like other Czechs, participated in demonstrations against the occupiers. Rather than calling it a demonstration, it was more like a frenzy filled with hatred. The streets were filled with sarcastic and mocking posters targeting the Soviet soldiers. Young men rode motorcycles and waved Czech flags, while girls wore unbelievably short miniskirts and kissed passers-by to provoke the sexual desires of the Soviet soldiers. In that context, the Soviet army was seen as clumsy, foolish, and bewildered, while the Czech people maintained their image of being clever, nimble, and full of humor. This period of ambiguity provided excellent material for photographer Teresa. For her personally, it was even the most brilliant time in her life. She took hundreds of rolls of film, and these photos appeared in various foreign newspapers. If it weren't for this occupation, she might never have had the opportunity to realize her talent. However, ultimately, clumsiness showed an irresistible force against agility. Soon, Dubček was forced to apologize on the radio, and the Prague Spring quickly came to an end. Once the situation was determined, the frenzy also ended. At Teresa's request, Tomas accepted the job in Switzerland. However, Teresa also wanted to leave because Tomas had too many mistresses in Prague and she wanted a change of environment. But after they arrived in Zurich, Tomas began dating Sabina again. We see that Teresa always found herself at a disadvantage in their marriage, like gravity, tethering Tomas's desires and preventing his life from becoming too ephemeral. But she realized that life hadn't changed at all, so she left without saying goodbye and returned to her hometown. Her departure briefly allowed Tomas to experience the lightness of being, which initially felt beautiful and warm. However, he soon found Teresa's sympathy too heavy to bear, and he had to return to their home in Prague. Of course, it can be anticipated that he would not experience any joy in their reunion. He put the shackles of responsibility on himself, his sympathy disappeared, and all he felt was stomach pain and despair. Their love story continued in a cycle of torment and need. After Sabina arrived in Switzerland, she found a new lover named Franz. Franz was a scholar who had achieved success in his career, but he was dissatisfied with being an intellectual confined to the academy. He believed that true reality lay outside. Sabina was not entirely satisfied with him because the cost of communication with Franz was much higher compared to Tomas. She didn't want to expend too much effort with him. They had many contradictions, both in terms of sexuality and aesthetics. Sabina enjoyed playing a passive role, but unlike Tomas, Franz lacked a dominant impulse. On the contrary, he believed that love was about actively giving up power. Compared to the impulse of life, Franz preferred to give everything meaning. For example, his love for Sabina arose because of his strong desire for adventure and romance. He felt that life should be grand and confront the threat of death. And Sabina happened to come from a country that had experienced war. This suffering made her extraordinarily beautiful, but in Sabina's eyes, it was just the reality of danger and ugliness. Sabina and Franz had a loose relationship, but Franz enjoyed adding drama to his life. It was as if he couldn't live without guilt and heavy responsibility. He voluntarily confessed his extramarital affair to his wife in an attempt to please Sabina. However, Sabina thought that this would make her the rival of a woman she didn't care about at all and she had no intention of marrying Franz. So overnight, she left Geneva and moved to Paris. Just like Tomas in the previous relationship, Sabina represented the lighter side in her relationship with Franz. In fact, she was more extreme than Tomas. She never took on any responsibility. Sabina's life was a constant cycle of leaving and betraying. In her eyes, beauty was a world that was abandoned. 
anything that everyone liked couldn't possibly be good. She betrayed her family, her spouse, love, and her homeland. But when there was nothing left to betray, she had nothing left to betray. Therefore, she deeply felt the emptiness of life's meaning and the unbearable lightness of being. During this time, Tomas had been fired from the hospital due to political reasons. To make a living, he had to work as a window cleaner. However, this job that took him from place to place provided him with more opportunities for affairs, which strained his relationship with Teresa. As mentioned earlier, it is difficult to say that Tomas enjoyed this lifestyle. He simply couldn't stop. So when Teresa became completely disappointed with the city of Prague and suggested moving to the countryside, they finally reached an agreement. Moving to the countryside meant cutting off all previous social relationships and getting away from reality and politics. Of course, we're not talking about a fairy tale story. Because in the narrative of Pastoral Idol, life has no weight. The author incorporated a metaphor into the ending, allowing them to die together in a car accident on a rainy day due to brake failure. Note that it was brake failure, not anything else. So you see, perhaps people ultimately find it difficult to enjoy excessive lightness. In the end, let's talk about Franz. After losing Sabina, he sought a more noble and weighty meaning in life. He learned about the ongoing wars in Vietnam and Cambodia and joined a petition group that marched towards the Cambodian border. The group consisted of doctors, intellectuals, journalists, and even celebrities. They all participated with similar sentiments, but on this Southeast Asian land, a group of white people became chaotic due to language barriers and conflicting views. They indulged in their own courage, adorning themselves with halos and taking photos along the way. To achieve the ideal distance for photography, a photographer stepped off the main road, further and further back, until he stepped on a landmine. This demonstration ended in failure because neither Vietnam nor Cambodia cared about how these white people were trying to move them. Disappointed, Franz left, but in Bangkok, he was attacked by robbers and lost his life in the struggle. We see that he came here with a very weighty purpose but ended up dying as light as a feather. Among this quartet, only Sabina survived in the end. She fell into rootless drifting, and the last we hear of her whereabouts is in the United States. This may be a possible exile destination for an Eastern European intellectual. That's the whole story. Kundera did not tell the story in a linear manner like traditional writers, as if he had no interest in doing so. On page 145, which is not even halfway through the book, he already foreshadowed the deaths of Tomas and Teresa and clearly stated their causes of death. He dared to do this because he had enough confidence in the structure and philosophical content of the book. As we mentioned before, these four characters form a quartet similar to some quartets by Beethoven or Haydn. The book is divided into seven chapters, corresponding to the seven movements of a quartet. Although their individual life stories are like the voices in a musical composition, as an artistic piece, the composition is a collection of voices. Therefore, there is no true protagonist. All four characters are protagonists. The governing force that drives this composition forward is the most fundamental thematic motive. Kitsch. This is also the most famous concept in Kandera's literary thought. The core of the unbearable lightness of being is not a love story but kitsch. In 1988, the film adaptation of the novel The Unbearable Lightness of Being was released in the United States, starring Daniel Day-Lewis and Juliette Binoche. To be honest, the film was well produced, and the actors were excellent, but it received mixed reactions in both the literary and film communities. The novel was adapted into a love story, and the true core message of Kitsch was lost in the adaptation. It is said that Kandera was very angry after watching the film and claimed that the movie had nothing to do with his book. Since then, he has refused all requests to purchase the film rights to his works. So, what exactly is Kitsch? The book provides an example. An American senator, watching children running on the lawn, said dreamily to Sabina, Look at them this is happiness. In Kandera's view, this is kitsch. Because there is no necessary connection between children running and happiness. It is also possible that children are running just to catch another child and hit them. The senator says this based solely on his own feelings. 
It is a predetermined sentimental scheme that connects these two things. Sentimentality leads to kitsch, where blind emotions triumph over reason. The senator's predictable next reaction would be to be moved by himself because he can actually find and cherish these little beauties in life. This is a typical kitsch response. In Kundera's view, the characteristic of kitsch is banality and an excessive reliance on emotions. People's hearts have already developed reflex-like responses to specific situations, where noble emotions are elevated in a widely recognized manner, and base emotions are debased in a widely recognized manner. Even landscapes are made pleasing in a widely recognized manner. This stable, unchanging, and explicit relationship is the mechanism of kitsch. As expected, when this mechanism is activated, people's hearts are aroused with corresponding emotions. So, we have to ask, who caused all of this? Are nobility and baseness so easily discernible? Can't the unpredictable beauty of nature evoke more complex and inexpressible emotions within us? Kundera condemns kitsch as the laziness of thought, where lazy thinking seeks out certain and unquestionable meanings to add weight to one's own life. The most typical kitsch character we see in the novel is Franz. It can be said that he is an unfit intellectual because he not only belittles his intellectual identity, but also fails to think independently. He only seeks out those certain meanings to achieve a sense of grandeur, to induce self awe and self hypnosis. Kitsch is like the beautiful mask that the world wears. Tomas and Teresa never stopped reflecting on their homeland and their inner selves, refusing to succumb to preconceived kitsch interpretations. As a result, they faced constant setbacks in reality. Tomas lost his job as a doctor, and Teresa's photographs became worthless once Western media lost interest in the Prague Spring. Her career as a photographer came to an end. Their move to the countryside was also an escape from kitsch. Sabina's escape, on the other hand, was even more complete. She constantly betrayed and refused to linger in fixed meanings imposed by others. Her resolute character and the desire to seek artistic truth drove her to explore realms few dared to enter, making her a true artist. Of course, the price was evident, as she became increasingly detached from the world, accompanied only by the unbearable lightness of being. Kundera's novel deviates from traditional linear narrative logic and incorporates extensive philosophical reflections, making it challenging to read. This is likely intentional on Kundera's part, as he challenges readers. In his view, a novel that presents predetermined meanings, aiming solely to evoke pleasure and sentimentality in readers, is also kitsch. In this sense, the unbearable lightness of being is a postmodern novel. Kundera asserts that it is meaningless to prove the existence of characters in a novel through detailed descriptions, as contemporary readers do not require much thought to understand that the characters are fictional. Therefore, the characters in his novel are relatively abstract and flat. Kundera focuses more on constructing their thoughts rather than describing their appearances, clothing, and actions. These four characters, to varying degrees, possess intellectual attributes. Besides their love and desires, their processes of speculation also drive the plot development of the novel. Furthermore, their love and desires are inseparable from their intellectual pursuits. Kundera is a master of dialectics. Under his pen, nothing is as simple as it seems. He is enthusiastic about uncovering the other side of things, revealing their complexity beyond initial impressions. He even claims that complexity is the soul of the novel. To some extent, Kundera is like a godlike author whose task is to reveal and expose the hidden content beneath the surface. However, this content is not some definitive truth but rather the absurdity of being human and the structural contradictions of society. After reading, it is difficult to say whether one will find a sense of satisfaction in answering questions. On the contrary, one may discover even more questions. Kundera's writing often helps us see an issue from the opposite perspective. Many of his sentences wait for a counter-strike after the narrative is completed and he is particularly charming when he utters the word but. For example, he describes dizziness in the following way. A person who constantly seeks to stand out should expect to feel dizzy someday. What is dizziness? Is it fear of falling? But how can we feel dizzy while standing on a platform with a sturdy railing? Dizziness is not about the fear of falling. It is something else entirely. 
It is the sound emanating from the emptiness below us, enticing and confusing us. It is the desire to jump down, which often leaves us afraid and desperate to resist this longing. Another example is Sabina's thoughts when she sees a cemetery. Sabina does not understand why the deceased would want those imitated palaces to weigh down on them. This cemetery is a petrified realm of fame and success. The beings in the cemetery are not awakened after death but rather become even more foolish than they were in life. They boast about their prominence on the tombstones. Resting here are not fathers, brothers, sons, or grandmothers, but rather celebrities, politicians, and individuals adorned with titles and honors. Even a lowly clerk has to display his identity, rank, and social status, his dignity, for others to admire. In these two passages, we can observe how Kandera subverts our familiar concepts and raises new questions from the opposite perspective. Afterward, our understanding of these things may not become more accurate, but it certainly becomes more complex because we reach a deeper level of meaning. Similarly, after reading the entire book, people will discover that kitsch is almost inevitable in life. In Kandera's conception of the novel, it is primarily a tool for understanding the world, rather than mere entertainment that provides readers with pleasure and emotional resonance. Guiding him throughout the process is the valuable legacy left by the Enlightenment, reason. In his view, reason should surpass emotions because emotions are dangerous and naive, easily slipping into kitsch. Kundera has a widely known saying, the struggle of man against power is the struggle of memory against forgetting. This statement is actually an ancient Jewish proverb. Its meaning is not to imply that human beings do not need to think, but rather to express that human thinking cannot exhaust all possibilities. When humans engage in thought, they cannot grasp the truth. If people fail to hear the laughter of God and believe that everything in life has a clear truth and that all things lead to certain emotions, then perhaps they will hear Kandera's laughter. In summary, here are the key points to remember from the unbearable lightness of being. 1. The unbearable lightness of being is Kandera's most famous and challenging work. It deviates from traditional linear storytelling and introduces four main characters, structured like a classical quartet in music. 2. The backdrop of the novel is the Prague Spring event in Czechoslovakia, but Kandera is not interested in depicting war. He focuses on the personal destinies that unfold amidst significant historical upheavals. These destinies are often intertwined with the character's understanding and contemplation of the world. 3. The essential contradiction in the meaning of life is between lightness and heaviness. Kandera questions weighty and grandiose ideas, but when characters constantly evade definitive meanings and pursue the lightness of being, they can become trapped in emptiness, leading to the unbearable lightness of existence. 4. Kandera views kitsch as characterized by banality and an over-reliance on emotions. Behind kitsch lies a set of sentimental patterns easily accepted by the majority without critical thought. Reason becomes the weapon to combat kitsch, emphasizing the importance of independent thinking to maintain clarity. 5. In Kandera's writing, things are never as simple as they seem. He is passionate about unveiling the other side of things, showcasing their complexity beyond initial impressions. By reading the novel, our understanding of these matters may not become more accurate, but it certainly becomes more complex as we delve into deeper layers of meaning. Well, that concludes the content for this episode. If you enjoyed my video, please click like, subscribe to my channel, and share it with your friends. Thank you.